Chapter Twenty Four of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raisky lay on the grass at the top of the cliff for a long time in gloomy meditation, groaning over the penalty he must pay for his generosity, suffering alike for himself and Vera. Perhaps she is laughing at my folly down there with him. Who is there? he cried aloud, stung with rage. I will have his name. He saw himself merely as a shield to cover her passion. He sprang up wildly and hurried down the precipice, tearing his clothes in the bushes and listening in vain for a suspicious rustling. He told himself that it was an evil thing to pry into another's secret. It was robbery. He stood still a moment to wipe the sweat from his brow, but his sufferings overcame his scruples. He felt his way stealthily forward, cursing every broken branch that cracked under his feet, and unconscious of the blows he received on his face from the rebounding branches as he forced his way through. He threw himself on the ground to regain his breath, then, in order not to betray his presence, crept along, digging his nails into the ground as he went. When he reached the suicide's grave, he halted, uncertain which way to follow, and at length made for the arbor, listening and searching the ground as he went. Meanwhile, everything was going on as usual in Tatiana Markovna's household. After supper, the company sat yawning in the hall, Tit Nikonich alone being indefatigable in his attentions, shuffling his foot when he made a polite remark, and looking at each lady as if he were ready to sacrifice everything for her sake. "'Where is Monsieur Boris?' inquired Polina Karpovna, addressing Tatiana Markovna. "'Probably he is paying a visit in the town he never says where he spends his time so that i never know where to send the carriage for him inquiries made of jacob revealed the fact that he had been in the garden up to a late hour vera was not in the house when she was summoned to tea she had left word that they were not to keep supper for her and that she would send a cross for some if she were hungry no one but Raisky had seen her go. Tatiana Markovna sighed over their perversity to be wandering about at such hour in such cold weather. I will go into the garden, said Polina Karpovna. Perhaps Monsieur Boris is not far away. He will be delighted to see me. I noticed, she continued confidentially, that he had something to say to me. He could not have known I was here. Marfinka whispered to Vikentiev that he did know, and had gone out on that account. "'I will go, Marfa Vasilyevna, and hide behind a bush, imitate Boris Pavlovich's voice, and make her a declaration,' suggested Vikentiev. "'Stay here, Nikolai Andreevich. Polina Karpovna might be frightened and faint. Then you would have to reckon with grandmother. "'I am going into the garden for a moment to fetch the fugitive,' said Polina Karpovna. "'God be with you, Polina Karpovna,' said Tatiana Markovna. "'Don't put your nose outside in the darkness, or at any rate take Yegorka with you to carry a lantern. No, I will go alone. It is not necessary for anyone to disturb us.' "'You ought not,' intervened Tit Nikonich politely, "'to go out after eight o'clock on these damp nights.' I would not have ventured to detain you, but a physician from Dusseldorf on the Rhine, whose book I am now reading, and can lend you if you like, and who gives excellent advice, says— Polina Karpovna interrupted him by asking him if he would see her home, and then went into the garden before he could resume his remarks. He agreed to her request and shut the door after her. Soon after Polina Karpovna's exit, there was a rustling and crackling on the precipice, and Raisky, wearing the aspect of a restless, wounded animal, appeared out of the darkness. He sat for several minutes motionless on Vera's favorite bench, covering his eyes with his hands. Was it dream or reality, he asked himself. 
He must have been mistaken. Such a thing could not be. He stood up, then sat down again to listen. With his hands lying listlessly on his knees, he broke into laughter over his doubts, his questionings, his secret. Again he had an access of terrible laughter. Vera and he. The cloak which he himself had sent to the exile lay near the arbor. The rogue had been clever enough to get two hundred and twenty roubles for the settlement of his wager, and the earlier eighty in addition. Secretaire Burdalakov. Again he laughed with a laugh very near a groan. Suddenly he stopped and put his hand to his side, seized with a sudden consciousness of pain. Vera was free, but he told himself she had dared to mock another fellow human being who had been rash enough to love her. She had mocked her friend. His soul cried for revenge. He sprang up intent on revenge, but was checked by the question of how to avenge himself. To bring Tatiana Markovna with lanterns and a crowd of servants, and to expose the scandal in a glare of light, to say to her, Here is the serpent you have carried for two and twenty years in your bosom. That would be a vulgar revenge, of which he knew himself to be incapable. Such a revenge would hit not Vera, but his aunt, who was to him like his mother. His head drooped for a moment, then he rose and hurried like a madman down the precipice once more. There, in the depths, passion was holding her festival. Night drew her curtain over the song of love, love with mark. If she had surrendered to another lover, to the tall, handsome Tushin, the owner of land, lake, and forest, and the Olympian tamer of horses, he could hardly breathe. Against his will there rose before him from the depths of the precipice the vision of Vera's figure, glorified with a seductive beauty that he had never yet seen in her, and though he was devoured by agony, he could not take his eyes from the vision. At her feet, like a lion at rest, lay Mark, with triumph on his face. Her foot rested on his head. Horror seized him and drove him onward to destroy and mar the vision. He seemed to hear in the air the flattering words, the songs and the sighs of passion. The vision became fainter, misenshrouded, and finally vanished into air. But the rage for revenge remained. Everywhere was stillness and darkness as he climbed the hill once more, but when he reached Vera's bench, he saw a human shadow. "'Who is there?' he cried. "'Monsieur Brice, it is I, Paulina.' "'You? What are you doing here?' "'I came because I knew. I knew that you have long had something to say to me, but have hesitated. Du courage. There is no one to see or hear us. Espérez tout what do you want speak out que vous m'aimez i have known it for a long time vous m'avez fui mais la passion vous a remené ici he seized her roughly by the hand and pushed her to the edge of the precipice ah de gosse mais pas si brusquement que ce que vous faites mais laissez donc she groaned her anxiety was not altogether groundless for she stood on the edge of an abrupt fall of the ground, and he grasped her hand more determinedly. "'You want love!' he cried to the terrified woman. "'Listen, tonight is love's night. Do you hear the sighs, the kisses, the breath of passion? Let me go! Let me go! I shall fall!' "'Away from here!' he cried, loosening his grasp and drawing a deep breath. Like a madman he ran across the garden, and the flower garden into the yard where Yegorka was washing his hands and face at the spring. Bring my trunk, he cried. I'm going to St. Petersburg in the morning. 
he ran water over his hands and washed his face and eyes before he turned to go to his room he could not stay within the four walls of his chamber he went out again and again unprotected against the cold to look at vera's window it was hardly possible to see ten paces ahead in the darkness he went to the acacia arbor to watch for vera's return and was furious because he could not conceal himself there now that the leaves had fallen he sat there in torture until morning dawned not from passion which had been drowned in that night's experiences what passion would stand such a shock as this but he had an unconquerable desire to look vera in the face this new vera and with one glance of scorn to show her the shame the affront she had put on him on their aunt on the whole household on their society on womanhood itself he awaited her return in a fever of impatience suddenly he sprang up with an evil look of triumph on his face fate has given me the idea he thought he found the gate still locked but there was a lamp before the icon in savelli's room and he ordered him to let him out and to leave the gates unlocked he took from his room the bouquet holder and hastened to the orangery to the gardener he had to wait a long time before it opened the light grew stronger when he looked over at the trees in the orangery an evil smile again crossed his face the gardener was arranging marfinka's bouquet i want another bouquet said raisky unsteadily oh, one like this no only orange blossoms he whispered turning paler as he spoke right sir said the gardener recalling that one of tatiana markovna's young ladies was betrothed i am thirsty said raisky give me a glass of water he drank the water greedily and hurried the gardener on when the second bouquet was ready he paid lavishly he returned to the house cautiously carrying the two bouquets as he did not know whether vera had returned in his absence he had marina called and sent her to see if her mistress was at home or had already gone out walking on hearing she was out he ordered marfinka's bouquet to be put on vera's table and the window to be opened then he dismissed marina and returned to the acacia arbor passion and jealousy set loose raged unchecked and when pity raised her head she was quenched by the torturing overmastering feeling of outrage he suppressed the low voice of sympathy and his better self was silent he was shuddering conscious that poison flowed in his veins the poison of lies and deception i must either shoot this dog mark or myself he thought he held the bouquet of orange blossoms in his two hands like a sacred thing and drank in its beauty with a wild delight then he fixed his eyes on the dark avenue but she did not come broad daylight came a fine rain began to fall and made the paths sodden at last vera appeared in the distance his heart beat faster and his knees trembled so that he had to steady himself by the bench to keep from falling she came slowly nearer with her bowed head wrapped in a dark mantilla held in place over her breast by her pale hands and walked into the porch without seeing him raisky sprang from his place of observation and hid himself under her window she entered her room in a dream without noticing that her clothes which she had flung on the floor when she went out had been put back again and without observing the bouquet on the table or the opened window mechanically she threw aside her mantilla and changed her muddy shoes for satin slippers then she sank down on the divan and closed her eyes after a brief minute she was awakened from her dream by a thud of something falling on the floor she opened her eyes and saw on the floor a great sheaf of orange blossoms which had plainly been thrown through the window 
pale as death, and without picking up the flowers, she hurried to the window. She saw Raisky as he went away and stood transfixed. He looked round, and their eyes met. She was seized by pain so sharp that she could hardly breathe and stepped back. Then she saw the bouquet intended for Marfinka on the table. She picked it up, half unconsciously, to press it to her face, but it slipped from her hands and she herself fell unconscious on the floor. End of chapter 24「donned their new dark blue kaftans, and their hair shone with grease. The women servants made a gay picture in their many-colored cotton dresses, head and neck kerchiefs, and the maids employed in the house diffused a scent of clothes within a ten yards radius. The cooks had donned their white caps in the early morning and had been incessantly busy in the preparation of the breakfast, dinner, and supper, to be served to the family and their guests, the kitchen and the servants the visitors brought with them. Tatiana Markovna had begun to make her toilet at eight o'clock as soon as she had given her orders. She descended to the hall to greet her guests with the reserved dignity of a great lady and the gentle smile of a happy mother and a hospitable hostess. She had set a small simple cap on her grey hair, the light brown silk dress that Raisky had brought from St. Petersburg suited her well, and round her neck she wore beautiful old lace. The Turkish shawl lay on the armchair in her room. Now she was preparing to drive to mass and walked slowly up and down the hall with crossed hands, awaiting the assembly of the household. She hardly noticed the bustle around her as the servants went hither and thither, sweeping the carpets, cleaning the lamps, dusting the mirrors, and taking the covers from the furniture. She went first to one window and then to the other, looking out meditatively on the road, the garden, and the courtyards. Vikentiev's mother was dressed in pearl grey with dark lace trimmings. Vikentiev himself had been in his dress coat and white gloves from eight o'clock onwards. Tatiana Markovna's pride and joy knew no bounds when Marfinka appeared, radiating gaiety from her bright eyes. While she slept, the walls of her two rooms had been decorated with flowers and garlands. She was going to put on her simple blouse when she woke, but instead there lay on the chair by her bed a morning gown of lace and muslin with pink ribbons. She had not had time to give vent to her admiration when she saw on two other chairs two lovely dresses, one pink and one blue, for her to make her choice for the gala day. She jumped up and threw on her new morning gown without waiting to put on her stockings, and when she approached her mirror she found a new surprise in the gifts that lay on her toilet table. She did not know which to look at or which to take up. First she opened a lovely rosewood casket which contained a complete dressing set, flasks, combs, brushes, and endless trifles in glass and silver, with a card bearing the name of her future mamma. Beside it lay cases of different sizes. She threw a quick glance in the mirror, smoothed back her abundant hair from her eyes, seized all the cases in a heap, and sat down on the bed to look at them. She hesitated to open them, and finally began with the smallest, which contained an emerald ring, which she hastily put on her finger. A larger case held earrings, which she inserted in her ears, and admired in the glass from the bed. There were massive gold bracelets set with rubies and diamonds, which she also put on, 
last of all she opened the largest case and looked astonished and dazzled at its splendid contents a chain of strung diamonds twenty-one to match her years the accompanying card said with this gift i confide to you another a costly one my best of friends myself take care of him your lover vikentiev she laughed looked round kissed the card blushed sprang from the bed and laid the case in her cupboard in the box where she kept her bonbons there was still another case on the table containing raisky's gift of a watch whose enamel cover bore her monogram and its chain she looked at it with wide eyes threw another glance at the other gifts and the garlanded walls then threw herself on a chair and wept hot tears of joy oh god she sobbed happily why does every one love me so i do no good to any one and never shall and so undressed without shoes and stockings but adorned with rings bracelets diamond earrings she tearfully sought her aunt who caressed and kissed her darling when she heard the cause of her tears god loves you marfinka because you love others because all who see you are infected by your happiness marfinka dried her tears nikolai andreevich loves me but he is my fiance so does his mamma but so does my cousin boris pavlovich and what am i to him the same as you are to every one no one can look at you and not be happy you are modest pure and good obedient to your grandmother spendthrift she murmured in an aside to hide her pleasure such a costly gift you shall hear of this borushka grandmother as if boris pavlovich could not have guessed it i have wanted a little enamelled watch like this for a long time you haven't asked your grandmother why she gives you nothing marfinka shut her mouth with a kiss grandmother she said love me always if you want to make me happy with my love i will give you my enduring gift she said making the sign of the cross over marfinka so that you shall not forget my blessing she went on feeling in her pocket you have given me two dresses grandmother but who decorated my room so magnificently your fiance and polina karpovna sent the things yesterday and kept them out of your sight vasilisa and pashutka hung the garlands up at daybreak the dresses are part of your trousseau and there are more to follow then taking from its case a gold cross with four large diamonds she hung it round the girl's neck and gave her a plain simple bracelet with the inscription from grandmother to her grandchild and with the name and the date marfinka kissed her aunt's hand and nearly wept once more all that grandmother has and she has many things will be divided between you and verochka now make haste how lovely you are to-day grandmother cousin is right tit nikonich will fall in love with you nonsense chatterbox go to verochka and tell her not to be late for mass i would have gone myself but am afraid of the steps directly grandmother cried marfinka and hastened to change her dress vera lay unconscious for half an hour before she came to herself the cold wind that streamed through the open window fell on her face and she sat up to look around her then she rose shut the window walked unsteadily to the bed sank down on it and drawing the cover over herself lay motionless overpowered with weakness she fell into a deep sleep with her hair loose over the pillow she slept heavily for about three hours until she was awakened by the noise in the courtyard the many voices the creaking of wheels and the sound of bells she opened her eyes looked round and listened there was a light knock at the door but vera did not stir there was a louder knock but she remained motionless at the third she got up glanced in the glass and was terrified by the sight of her own face 
She pushed her hair into order, threw a shawl over her shoulders, picked up Marfinger's bouquet from the floor and laid it on the table. There was another knock and she opened the door. Marfinka, gay and lovely, gleaming like a rainbow in her pretty clothes, flew into the room. When she saw her sister, she stood still in amazement. What is the matter with you, Verochka? Aren't you well? Not quite. I offer you my congratulations. The sisters kissed one another. How lovely you are and how beautifully dressed, said Vera, making a faint attempt to smile. Her lips framed one, but her eyes were like the eyes of a corpse that no one has remembered to close. But she felt she must control herself and hastened to present Marfinka with the bouquet. What a lovely bouquet! And what is this? asked Marfinka as she felt a hard substance and discovered the holder set with her name and the pearls. You too, Verochka! How is it you all love me so? I love you all how i love you but how and when you found out that i did i cannot think vera was not capable of answering but she caressed marfinka's shoulder affectionately i must sit down she said i have slept badly through the night grandmother calls you to mass i cannot darling tell her i am unwell and cannot leave the house today. what are you not coming I shall stay in bed. Perhaps I caught cold yesterday. Tell grandmother. We will come to you. You would only disturb me. Then we shall send everything over. Ah, Verochka, people have sent me so many presents and flowers and bonbons. I must show them to you. And she ran over a list of them. Yes, show me everything. Perhaps I will come later, said Vera absently. Another bouquet? asked marfinka pointing to the one that lay on the floor for whom how lovely oh, for you too said vera turning paler she picked a ribbon hastily from a drawer and fastened the bouquet with it then she kissed her sister and sank down on the divan you are really ill how pale you are shall i tell grandmother and let her send for the doctor how sad that it should be on my birthday the day is spoiled for me it will pass don't say a word to grandmother don't frighten her leave me now i must rest at last marfinka went vera shut the door after her and lay down on the divan end of chapter twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Raisky returned to his room at daybreak and looked in the mirror, he hardly recognized himself. He felt chilly and sent Marina for a glass of wine, which he drank before he threw himself on his bed. Overcome by moral and physical exhaustion, he slept as if he had thrown himself into the arms of a friend and had confided his trouble to him. Sleep did him the service of a friend, for it carried him far from Vera, from Malinovka, from the precipice, from the fantastic vision of last night. When the ringing of many bells awoke him, he lay for several minutes under the soothing influence of the physical rest which built a rampart between him and yesterday. There was no agony in his awakening moments, but soon memory revived and his face wore an expression more terrible than in the worst moments of yesterday. A pain different from yesterday's, a new devil, had hurled itself upon him. He seized one piece of clothing after another and dressed as hastily and nervously as Vera had done as she prepared to go to the precipice. He rang for Yegorka, from whom he learned that everybody except Vera, who was not well, had driven to mass. In wild agitation he dashed across to the old house. There was no response when he knocked at Vera's door. He opened it cautiously and stole in like a man with murderous intent, with horror imprinted on his features, and advanced on tiptoe, trembling, 
deadly pale, with swaying steps, as if he might fall at any minute. Vera lay on the divan, with her face turned away, her hair falling down almost to the floor, and her slipper-clad feet hardly covered by her grey skirt. She tried to turn round when she heard the noise of the opening door, but could not. He approached, knelt at her feet, and pressed his lips to the slipper she wore. Suddenly she turned and stared at him in astonishment. Is it comedy or romance, Boris Pavlovich? she asked brusquely, turned in annoyance and hid her foot under the skirt, which she straightened quickly. No, Vera, tragedy, he whispered in a lifeless voice, and sat down on the chair near the divan. The tone of his voice moved her to turn and look keenly at him, and her eyes opened wide with astonishment. She threw aside her shawl and rose. She had divined in Raisky's face the presence of the same deadly suffering that she herself endured. What is your trouble? Are you unhappy? she said, laying her hand on his shoulder. In the simple word and in the tone of her voice, there were revealed the generous qualities of a woman, sympathy, selflessness, and love. Keenly touched by the kindness and tenderness in her voice, he looked at her with the same rapturous gratitude which she had worn on her face yesterday when, in self-forgetfulness, he had helped her down the precipice. She returned generosity with generosity, just as yesterday there had streamed from him a gleam of one of the highest qualities of the human mind. He was all the more in despair over what he had done, and wept hot tears. He hid his face in his hands, like a man for whom all is lost. What have I done? I have insulted you, woman and sister. Do not make us both suffer, she said in a gentle, friendly tone. Spare me. You see how I am. He tried not to meet her eyes, and she again lay down on the divan. What a blow I dealt you, he whispered in horror. You see my punishment, Vera. Your blow gave me a minute's pain, and then I understood that it was not delivered with an indifferent hand that you loved me, and it became clear to me how you must have suffered yesterday. Don't justify my crime, Vera. A knife is a knife, and I aimed a knife at you. You brought me to myself. I was as if I slept, and you, grandmother, Marfinka, and the whole house I saw as if in a dream. What am I to do, Vera? Fly from here? In what a state of mind I should leave? Let me endure my penance here, and be reconciled, as far as is possible, with myself, with all that has happened here. Your imagination paints what was only a fault, as a crime. Remember your condition when you did it, your agitation. She gave him her hand and continued, I know now what one is capable of doing in the fever of emotion. She set herself to calm him in spite of her own weariness. You are good, Vera, and woman-like. Judge not with your brain, but with your heart. You are too severe with yourself. Another would have thought himself justified after all the jesting. You remember those letters? With whatever good intention of calming your agitation, of answering your jest with jests, it was malicious mockery. You suffered more from those letters than I did yesterday. Oh, dear, no! I have often laughed over them, especially when you asked for a cloak, a rug, and money for the exile. What money? What cloak? What exile? She exclaimed in astonishment. I don't understand. I myself had suspicions, he said, his face clearing a little. I could not believe that that was your idea. And in a few words he told her the contents of the two letters. Her lips turned white. Natasha and I wrote to you turn and turn about in the same handwriting, amusing little letters in which we tried to imitate yours, that is all. 
i didn't know anything about the other letters she whispered turning her face to the wall raisky strode up and down in thought while vera appeared to be resting exhausted by the conversation cousin she said suddenly i ask your help in a very important matter and i know you will not refuse me a glance at his face told her that there was nothing she could not ask of him while i still have strength i want to tell you the whole history of this year why should you do that i will not and i ought not to know do not disturb me boris i can hardly breathe and time is precious i will tell you the whole story and you must repeat it to our grandmother i could not do it she said my tongue would not say the words i would rather die he looked at her with an expression of blank terror but why should grandmother be told think of the consequences would it not be better to keep her in ignorance no the burden must be borne it is possible that grandmother and i will both die of it or we shall lose our senses but i will not deceive her she ought to have known it long ago but i hoped to be able to tell her another story and therefore was silent to tell her everything even of yesterday evening he asked in a low tone and the name also she nodded almost imperceptibly in assent then she made him sit down on the divan beside her and in low broken sentences told the story of her relations with mark when she had finished she wrapped herself shivering with cold in her shawl he rose from his seat both were silent each of them in terror she as she thought of her grandmother he as he thought of them both before him lay the prospect of having to deal tatiana markovna one thrust after another and that not in the heat of passion or in an access of blind revenge but in the consciousness of a most painful duty it might be as she said an important service but it was certainly a terrible commission when shall i tell her he asked as soon as possible for i shall suffer so long as i know she is in ignorance and now give me the eau de cologne from the dressing-table and leave me alone it would not do to tell grandmother to-day when the house is full of guests but to-morrow said raisky how shall i survive it but till to-morrow calm her by some means or other so that she has no suspicion and sends no one here she closed her eyes in a longing for impenetrable night for rest without an awakening she would like to have been turned into a thing of stone so that she could neither think nor feel when he left her he was weighed down with a greater weight of fear than that which he had brought to the interview vera rose as soon as he left her closed the door and lay down again she had found consolation and help in raisky's friendship his sympathy and devotion as a drowning man rises to the surface for a moment but as soon as he was gone she fell back deeper into the depths she told herself in despair that life was over before her there stretched the bare step there was no longer for her a family nor anything on which a woman's life depends she would have to stand before her aunt to look her in the eyes and to tell her how she had recompensed her love and care suddenly she heard steps and her aunt's voice pale and motionless as if she had lost the use of hands and feet she listened to the light tap at the door i will not get up i cannot she thought but when the knock was repeated she sprang up with a strength which astonished herself dried her eyes and went smiling to meet her aunt when tatiana markovna had heard from marfinka that vera was ill and would remain in her room all day she had come herself to inquire she glanced at vera and sat down on the divan 
this service has tired me so that i could hardly walk up the steps what's the matter with you vera she continued looking keenly at her i congratulate marvinka on her birthday said vera in the voice of a little girl who has learned her speech by heart she kissed her grandmother's hand and wondered how she had managed to bring the words over her lips i got wet feet yesterday and have a headache she tried to smile but there was no smile on her lips you must rub your feet with spirit remarked tatiana markovna who had noticed the strained voice and the unnatural smile and guessed a lack of frankness are you coming to be with us vera don't force yourself to do so and so make yourself worse she continued seeing that vera was incapable of answering vera was all the more frightened by her aunt's consideration for her her conscience stirred and she felt that tatiana markovna must already know all and that her confession would come too late she was on the point of falling on her breast and making her confession there and then but her strength failed her excuse me grandmother from dinner perhaps i will come over in the afternoon as you like i will send your dinner across thank you i'm already quite hungry said vera quickly without knowing what she said tatiana markovna kissed her and stroked her hair remarking casually that one of the maids should come and do her room as she might have a visitor tatiana markovna returned sadly to the house she was indeed politely attentive to her guests as she always was but raisky noticed immediately that something was wrong with her after her visit to vera she found it hard to restrain her emotion hardly touched the food did not even look round when petrushka smashed a pile of plates and more than once broke off in the middle of a sentence in the afternoon as the guests took coffee on the broad terrace in the mild september sunshine tatiana markovna moved among her guests as if she were hardly aware of them raisky wore a gloomy air and had eyes for no one but his aunt something is wrong with vera she whispered to him she is in trouble have you seen her no he said but his aunt looked at him as if she doubted what he said Polina Karpovna had not come. She had sent word that she was ill, and the messenger brought flowers and plants for Marfinka. In order to explain the scene of the day before, and to find out whether she had guessed anything, Raisky had paid a visit in the morning to Polina Karpovna. She received him with a pretense of being offended, but with hardly disguised satisfaction. His excuse was that he had dined with friends that night and had had a glass too much. He begged for forgiveness, which was accorded with a smile, all which did not prevent Polina Karpovna from recounting to all her acquaintance her love scene. Tushin came to dinner and brought Marfinka a lovely pony to ride. He asked for Vera and was plainly disturbed when he heard of the indisposition which prevented her from coming to dinner. Tatiana Markovna observed him, wondering why Vera's absence had such a remarkable effect on him, though this had often been the case before without exciting any surprise on her part. She could not keep out of her head anxiety as to what change had come over Vera since yesterday evening. She had had a little quarrel with Tit Nikonich, and had scolded him for having brought Marfinka the Sèvres mirror. Afterwards she was closeted with him for a quarter of an hour in her sitting-room, and he emerged from the interview looking serious. He shifted his foot less, and even when he was talking to ladies his serious inquiring glance would wander to Raisky or Tushin up till this time tatiana markovna had been so gay her one anxiety and at the moment the only one perhaps had been the celebration of vera's name day a fortnight ahead she would have liked to have celebrated it with the same magnificence as marfinka's birthday although vera had roundly declared 
that on that day she meant to go on a visit to Anna Ivanovna Tushin, or to her friend Natasha. But how Tatiana Markovna had changed since Mass. As she talked with her guests, she was thinking only of Vera, and gave absent-minded answers. The excuse of a cold had not deceived her, and as she had touched Vera's brow on leaving her, she had realized that a cold could be nothing but a pretext. She remembered that Vera and Rysky had vanished in the afternoon, and that neither had appeared at supper. She was constantly watching Rysky, who sought to avoid her glance, thereby only arousing her suspicions the more. Then Vera herself unexpectedly appeared amongst the guests, wearing a warm mantilla over her light dress and a wrap round her throat. Raisky was so astonished that he looked at her as if she were an apparition. A few hours ago she had been almost too exhausted to speak, and now here she was in person. He wondered where women found their strength. Vera went round speaking to the guests, looked at Marfinka's presence, and ate, to quench her thirst, as she said, a slice of watermelon. Tatiana Markovna was to some extent relieved to see Vera, but it disturbed her to notice that Raisky's face had changed. For the first time in her life she cursed her guests. They were just sitting down to cards, then there would be tea, and then supper, and Vikentiev was not going until tomorrow morning. End of chapter 26Chapter 27 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raisky found himself between two fires. On the one hand, Tatiana Markovna looked at him as much as to say that he probably knew what was the matter with Vera, while Vera's despairing glance betrayed her anxiety for the moment of her confession. He himself would have liked to have sunk into the earth. Tushin looked in an extraordinary manner at Vera as both Tatiana Markovna and Raisky, but most of all Vera herself noticed. She was terrified and asked herself whether he had heard any rumour. He esteemed her so highly, thought her the noblest woman in the world, and, if she were silent, she would be accepting his esteem on false premises. He, too, would have to be told, she thought. She exchanged greetings with him without meeting his eyes, and he looked strangely at her, timidly and sympathetically. Vera told herself that she must know what was in his mind, that if he looked at her again like that, she would collapse. He did look at her again, and she could endure no more, and left the company. Before she went, she signed secretly to Tushin to follow her. I cannot receive you in the old house, she said. Come into the avenue. Is it not? too damp as you're not well that does not matter she said he looked at his watch and said that he would be going in an hour after giving orders to have his horses taken out of the stable and brought into the yard he picked up his silver-handed whip and with his cloak on his arm followed vera into the avenue i will not beat about the bush he said what is the matter with you today you have something on your mind. She wrapped her face in her mantilla as she spoke, and her shoulders shivered as if with cold. She dare not raise her eyes to him as he strode silently beside her. But you are ill, Vera Vasilievna. I had better talk to you another time. You were not wrong in thinking I had something to say to you. No, Ivan Ivanovitch, let it be today. I want to know what you have to say to me. I myself wanted to talk to you, but perhaps it is too late for what I have to say. Do you speak? She said, wondering painfully how and where he could have learned her secret. I came here today, he said as they sat down on the bench. What have you to say to me? Speak. 
she interrupted. How can I say it to you now, Vera Vasilyevna? said Tushin, springing to his feet. Do not make me suffer, she murmured. I love you. Yes, I know it, she interrupted. But what have you heard? I have heard nothing, he said, looking round in amazement. He was now for the first time aware of her agitation, and his heart stood still with delight. She has guessed my secret and shares my feelings, he thought. And what she is asking is for a frank, brief avowal. You are so noble, so beautiful, Vera Vasilyevna, so pure. An exclamation was wrung from her, and she would have risen but could not. You mock me, you mock me she said raising her hands beseechingly you are ill vera vasilyevna he said looking at her in terror forgive me for having spoken to you at such a time a day earlier or later makes no difference say what you have to say for i also desire to tell you why i have brought you here is it really true he cried hardly knowing how to contain his delight what is true you want to say something else not what i expected she said speak and do not prolong my sufferings i love you he repeated if you can grant what i have confessed to you and i am not worthy of it if your love is not given elsewhere then be my forest queen my wife and there will be no happier man on earth than i that is what i have long wished to say to you and have not dared I should have done it on your name-day, but I could no longer endure the suspense, and have come to-day on the family festival on your sister's birthday. Ivan Ivanovitch, she moaned. The thought flashed through his head like lightning that this was no expression of joy, and he felt his hair was beginning to stand on end. He sat down beside her and said, What is wrong with you, Vera Vasilyevna? You are either ill or are bearing a great sorrow. Yes, Ivan Ivanovitch, I feel that I shall die. What is your trouble? For God's sake, tell me. You said that you had something to confide in me, which means that I must be necessary to you. There is nothing I would not do for you. You have only to command me. Forgive me my too hasty speech. You too, my poor Ivan Ivanovitch. I can find neither prayers nor tears, nor is there any guidance or help for me anywhere. What words of despair are these, Vera Vasilyevna? Do you know whom you love? He threw his cloak on the bench and wiped the sweat from his brow. Her words told him that his hopes were ruined, that her love was given elsewhere. He drew a deep breath and sat motionless awaiting her further explanations. My poor friend, she said, taking his hand. The simple words filled him with new sorrow. He knew that he was in fact to be pitied. Thank you, he whispered. Forgive me, I did not know, Vera Vasilyevna. I am a fool. Please forget my declaration. But I should like to help you, since you say yourself you rely on me for a service. I thank you for holding me worthy of that. You stand so high above me. I always feel that you stand so high, Vera Vasilyevna. My poor Ivan Ivanovitch! I have fallen from those heights, and no human power can reinstate me, she said as she led him to the edge of the precipice. Do you know this place? she asked. Yes, a suicide is buried there. There, in the depths below the precipice, your pure vera also lies buried she said with a decision of despair what are you saying i don't understand enlighten me vera vasilyevna summoning all her strength she bent her head and whispered a few words to him then returned and sank down on the bench tushin turned pale swayed lost his balance and sat down beside her even in the dim light Vera noticed his pallor. And I thought, he said with a strange smile, as if he were ashamed of his weakness, 
rising to his feet with difficulty, that only a bear was strong enough to knock me over. Then he stooped to her and whispered, Who? The question sent a shudder through her, but she answered quickly, Mark Volokov. His face twitched ominously. Then he pressed his whip over his knee so that it split in pieces, which he hurled away from him. So it will end with him too, he shouted. As he stood trembling before her, stooping forward with wild eyes, he was like an animal ready to spring on the enemy. Is he there now? he cried, pointing with a violent gesture in the direction of the precipice. She looked at him as if he were a dangerous animal, as he stood there breathing heavily. Then she rose and took refuge behind the bench. I am afraid, Ivan Ivanovitch, spare me. Go! she exclaimed, warding him off with her arms. First I will kill him, and then I will go. Are you going to do this for my sake? For my peace of mind, or for your own sake? He kept silence, his eyes fixed on the ground, and then began to walk about in great strides. What should I do? he said, still trembling with agitation. Tell me, Vera Vasilievna. First of all, calm yourself, and explain to me why you wish to kill him, and whether I desire it. He is your enemy, consequently also mine. Does one kill one's enemies? He bent his head, and seeing the pieces of the whip lying on the ground, he picked them up as if he were ashamed, and put them in his pocket. I do not accuse him. I alone bear the blame, and he has justification, she said with such bitter misery that Tushin took her hand. Vera Vasilievna, he said, you are suffering horribly. I do not understand he went on looking at her with sympathy and admiration. What you mean by saying that he has justification, and that you bring no accusation against him? If that's the case, why did you wish to speak to me and call me here into the avenue? Because I wanted you to know the whole truth. Don't leave me in the dark, Vera Vasilievna. You must have had some reason for confiding your secret to me. You looked at me so strangely today that I could not understand your meaning, and thought you must already be informed of all that had happened, and could not rest until I knew what was in your mind. I was too hasty, but it comes to the same thing, for sooner or later I should have told you. Sit down and hear what I have to say, and then have done with me. She explained the situation to him in a few words. So you forgive him? he asked after a moment's thought. Forgive him, of course. I tell you that I alone am guilty. Have you separated from him, or do you hope for his return? There is nothing whatever in common between us, and we shall never see one another again. Now I understand a little, for the first time, but still not everything, said Tushin, sighing bitterly. I thought you had been vulgarly betrayed, and since you called me to your help, I imagined that the time had come for the bear to do his duty. I was on the point of rendering you the service of a bear, and it was for that reason that I permitted myself to ask boldly for the man's name. Forgive me, and now tell me why you have revealed the story to me because I was not willing that you should think better of me than I deserve, and esteem me. But how would you accomplish that? I shall not cease to think of you as I have always thought of you, and I cannot do otherwise than respect you. A gleam of pleasure lighted her eyes, only to be immediately extinguished. You want to restore my self-esteem, she said, because you are good and generous. You are sorry for a poor unfortunate girl and want to raise her up again. I understand your generosity, Ivan Ivanovitch, but I will have none of it. Vera Vasilievna, he said, kissing her hand, I could not esteem anybody under compulsion. If I give anyone a greeting in the street, he has my esteem. 
if he has not my esteem i pass him by i greet you as before and because you are unhappy my love for you is greater than before you are enduring a great sorrow as i am you have lost your hopes of happiness he added in a low melancholy tone if you had kept your secret from me and i had heard it by chance even so my esteem for you could not have been diminished for there is no duty laid on you to reveal a secret which belongs to you alone no one has the right to judge you the last words were spoken in a trembling voice which made it clear that he also was oppressed by the secret the weight of which he desired to lighten for vera i had to tell you to-day when you made your declaration to me i felt it was impossible to leave you in ignorance you might very well have answered me with a categorical no but since you do me the honour vera vasilievna of bestowing your particular friendship on me you might have gilded your no by saying that you loved another that would have been sufficient for me for i should never have asked you who and your secret would without doubt have remained your own he pointed to the precipice and collecting his whole strength whispered a misfortune although he tried with all his might not to let her see how disturbed he was he was hardly able to speak clearly a misfortune he repeated you say that he has justification that the guilt is yours if that is so where does justice lie i told you ivan ivanovitch that my confession was not necessary for your sake but for mine you know how i esteem your friendship and it would have caused me unspeakable pain to deceive you even now when i have hidden nothing from you i cannot look you in the eyes tears stifled her voice and it was with difficulty that tushin held back his own tears he stooped and kissed her hand once more thanks a thousand thanks vera vasilievna i see that an affection for another has no power to lessen your friendship for me and that is a wonderful consolation ivan ivanovitch if i could only cut this year out of my life a speedy forgetfulness he said comes to the same thing how can i forget and where can i find the strength to endure its memory you will find strength in friendship and i am one of your friends she breathed another air for the moment conscious that there was beside her a tower of strength under whose shadow her passion and her pain were alleviated i believe in your friendship ivan ivanovitch and thank you for it she said drying her tears i already feel calmer and should feel still calmer if grandmother she does not yet know anything of this he asked but broke off immediately in the consciousness that his question involved a reproach she has guests to-day and could not possibly be told but to-morrow she shall learn all farewell ivan ivanovitch my head aches and i am going back to the house to lie down tushin looked at vera asking himself how any man could be such a blind fool as volokov or is he merely a beast he thought to himself in impotent rage he pulled himself together however and asked her if she had any instructions for him please ask natasha she said to come over to me to-morrow or the next day and may i come one day next week to inquire whether you are better do not be anxious ivan ivanovitch and now good-bye for i can hardly stand when he left her he drove his horses so wildly down the steep hill that he himself was in danger of being hurled to the bottom of the precipice when he put his hand out as usual for his whip it was not there and he remembered that he had broken it and threw away the useless pieces on the road in spite of his mad haste he reached the volga too late for the ferry he had to stay in the town with a friend 
and drove next morning to his home in the forest. End of chapter 27「twenty eight of the precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Tatiana Markovna's house, servants, cooks, and coachmen were all astir, and at a very early hour in the morning were already drunk. The mistress of the house herself was unusually silent and sad when she let Marfinka go with her future mother-in-law. She had no instructions or advice to give, and hardly listened to Marfinka's questions about what she ought to take with her. "'What do you like?' she said absently, and gave orders to Vasilisa and the maid who was going with Marfinka to Kolchina to put everything in order and pack up what was necessary." She handed over her dear child to Marfa Yegorovna's charge, at the same time pointing out to Marfinka's fiancé that he must take the greatest care of her, and that in order not to give strangers a wrong impression, he must be more dignified and must not chase about the garden and the woods with her as he did in Malinovka. When she saw that Vikentiev colored at this advice, which indicated doubt of his tactfulness, and that Marfa Yegorovna bit her under lip. Tatiana Markovna changed her tone, she laid her hand on his shoulder, calling him dear Nikolinka, and telling him that she knew herself how unnecessary her words were, but that old women like to preach. Then she sighed and said not another word to her guests before their departure. Vera, too, came to breakfast. She looked pale, and it was clear that she had had a sleepless night. She said she still had a headache, but felt better than she did yesterday. There was no change in Tatiana Markovna's affectionate manner to her. Now and then Marfa Yegorovna cast questioning glances in Vera's direction. What was the meaning of pain without any definite illness? Why did she not appear yesterday until after dinner, and then only for a moment, to go out followed by Tushin? What had they found to say to one another for an hour in the twilight? Being a sensible woman, she did not pursue these inquiries, though they flashed for a moment in her eyes, nevertheless Vera saw them, although they were quickly exchanged for looks of sympathy. Neither did Marfa Yegorovna's questioning glances escape Tatiana Markovna, who kept her eyes on the ground while Vera maintained her indifferent manner. Already people are wondering what had happened, thought Tatiana Markovna sadly. On my arms she came into the world. She is my child, and yet I do not know what her trouble is. Raisky had been out for a walk before breakfast, and wore on his face a look as if he had just come to a decision on a momentous question. He looked at Vera as calmly as at the others, and did not avoid Tatiana Markovna's eyes. He promised Vikentiev to come over to see him in a day or two, and listened attentively to his guest's conversation about hunting and fishing. At last everything was ready for their departure. Tatiana Markovna and Raisky went with their guests as far as the Volga, leaving Vera at home. Vera's world had always been a small one, and its boundaries were now drawn more narrowly than ever. She had been contented during the long years with the observation and experience which were accessible to her in her immediate environment. Her small circle represented to her the crowd, she made her own in a short time what it took others many years in many places to learn. Unlike Marfinka, she was cautious in her sympathies, granting her friendship only to the priest's wife and to Tushin, whom she openly called her friend. The simple things and the simple people who surrounded her did not serve only trivial purposes. She understood how to embroider 
on this ordinary canvas the bold pattern of a richer life with other needs thoughts and feelings she guessed at these by reading between the lines of everyday life other lines which expressed the desires of her mind and heart if she was cautious in her sympathies she was excessively so in the sphere of thought and knowledge she read books from the library in the old house taking from the shelves at first without choice or system as a pastime whatever came into her hands then she began to experience curiosity and finally a definite desire for knowledge she was keen-sighted enough to understand how aimless and unfruitful it was to wander among these other minds without any guiding thread without making direct inquiries she procured some explanations from kozlov and although she understood many things at a bound she never let it be seen that she had any knowledge of things beyond her immediate circle without losing sight of kozlov's instructions she read the books once more to find that they meant much more to her and that her interest in them was steadily increasing at the request of the young priest natasha's husband she brought him books too and listened when he expressed his views on this or that author without herself adopting the seminarist view later on she came into contact with mark who brought a new light to bear on all that she had read and heard and known his attitude was one of blank denial no authority in heaven or earth weighed with him he despised science as it had hitherto developed and made no distinction between virtue and crime if he thought that he would soon be able to triumph over vera's convictions he was mistaken she regarded these bold and often alluring ideas with shy admiration without giving herself up blindly to their influence she listened cautiously to the preaching of the apostle but found in it neither a new life nor happiness nor truth and though she followed attentively what he had to say it was only because she was drawn on by the ardent desire to find the reality that lay behind mark's extraordinary and audacious personality mark displayed his unsparing negation enmity and scorn against all that men believe love and hope for vera did not agree with all she heard because she observed the malady that lay concealed behind the teaching even if she could not discover where it lay her columbus could show her nothing but a row of open graves standing ready to receive all that by which society had hitherto existed vera remembered the story of pharaoh's lean kine which without themselves becoming fatter devoured the fat kine mark would have despoiled mankind of his crown in the name of wisdom he would acknowledge in him nothing but an animal organism and while he denied man in man denied him the possession of a soul and the right to immortality he yet spoke of his strivings to introduce a better order of things neglecting to observe that in accordance with his own theory of the chance arrangement of existence by which men herd together like flies in the hot weather such efforts were useless granting the correctness of his ideas as a premise thought vera there can be no sense in striving to be better kinder truer and purer if this life enduring only for a few decades is the end of all things when she looked deeper into the matter and examined the new truth taught by the young apostle the new conception of good and the new revelation she saw with astonishment that what in his talk was good and incontrovertible was not new that it was derived from sources from which others also drew who certainly did not belong to the new society she recognized that the seed of the new civilization which 
he preached with so much boastfulness and such a parade of mystery lay in the old-fashioned doctrine and for this reason she believed more firmly than ever in the older philosophy of life she looked on mark's personality with such suspicion that she gradually withdrew herself from his influence hideously disturbed by his audacity of thought she had even gone so far as to tell tatiana markovna of this accidental acquaintance with the result that the old lady told the servants to keep a watch on the garden but volokov came from the direction of the precipice from which the watchmen were effectually kept away by their superstitious fears mark himself had noted vera's distrust and he set himself to overcome it he was the more easily able to accomplish this because when her interest was once awakened she met him halfway imperceptibly to herself she meditated carefully on the facts that made up her life her mind was occupied by new questionings and for that reason she listened more attentively to his words when she met him in the fields often they went out walking on the banks of the volga and eventually found a meeting place in the arbor at the bottom of the precipice gradually vera adopted a more active role in their intercourse she wanted to convert him to lead him back to the acceptance of proved truth the truth of love of human as opposed to animal happiness of faith and hope mark gave way in some things though only gradually his manners became less eccentric he was less provocative in his behaviour to the police than before he lived in a more orderly fashion and ceased to stud his conversation with cynical remarks the change pleased vera and this was the cause of the happy excitement that tatiana markovna and raisky had remarked in her since her influence was effective even if only in what affected his external life she hoped by incessant effort and sacrifice gradually to produce a miracle her reward was to be the happiness of being loved by the man of her heart's choice she flattered herself that she would be introducing a new strong man into society if he were to show himself in wisdom and strength of will simply and reliable as tushin was her life was mapped out for her while she was engaged in these efforts she allowed her passionate nature to be carried away by his personality she fell in love not with his doctrine which she refused to accept but with himself he called to new activity but she saw in his appeal nothing more than the lending of forbidden books she agreed with him that work was necessary and herself avoided idleness she drew up for herself a picture of simple genuine activity for the future and envied marfinka because she understood how to make herself useful in the house and the village she intended to share these labors with her sister when once the stiff battle with mark had been brought to a conclusion but the struggle was not to end with a victory for either one or the other but with mutual overthrow and a permanent separation these were the thoughts that passed through vera's mind while tatiana markovna and raisky were accompanying their guests and marfinka as far as the volga what was the wolf doing now was he enjoying his triumph she took from her letter-case a sealed letter on blue paper which she had received early that morning and looked at it thoughtfully for a minute before she threw it down with its seals unbroken on the table all her troubles were submerged in the painful question what would become of her grandmother raisky had already whispered to vera that he would speak to tatiana markovna that evening if she were alone and that he would take care that none of the servants should have the opportunity of seeing the impression which the news was bound to make on her vera shivered with foreboding when he spoke of these precautions she would have liked to have died before evening came 
after her talk of past events with Raisky and Tushin, she recovered something of her usual calmness. A part of her burden was gone now, that, like a sailor in a storm, she had lightened the ship of some of its ballast, but she felt that the heaviest load of all still lay on her conscience. It is impossible to go on living like this, she told herself, as she made her way to the chapel. There, on her knees, she looked anxiously up at the holy picture, as if she expected a sign. But the sign she longed for was not granted, and she passed out of the chapel in despair as one who lay under the ban of God. End of chapter 28《Chapter Twenty Nine of The Precipice》by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Tatiana Markovna returned from the ferry, she sat down to work at her accounts, but soon laid them aside and dismissed the servants. She asked for Raisky, who had gone over to see Kozlov because he did not want to be left alone with his aunt. She sent across to ask Vera whether she was coming to dinner. Vera said that she would rather stay in her room and go to bed early. In the courtyard, a scene by no means unusual was being enacted. Savelli had nearly broken Marina's back with a severe beating because he had seen her slipping out at dawn from the room in which Vikentiev's servant was quartered. She hid herself in the fields and the vegetable garden, but at last she emerged, thinking that he would have forgotten. He struck her with the whip while she sought refuge in one corner after another, swearing by all that was sacred that the devil had taken on her figure and had made a fool of him. But when he exchanged the whip for the stick, she cried out loud at the first blow and fell at his feet. I am guilty! she cried begging for mercy she promised not to transgress again calling god to witness of her sincerity thereupon savelli threw away the stick and wiped his face with his sleeve you may go this time he said since you have confessed and since you call god to witness tatiana markovna was informed of this proceeding but she only wrinkled her forehead and made a sign to Vasilisa not to be too severe with Marina. There were visitors to dinner who had heard of Vera's indisposition and had come to inquire. Tatiana Markovna spoke of a chill, suffering all the time from her insincerity, since she did not know what was the truth that lay behind this feigned illness. She had not dared to send for the doctor, who would have immediately seen that it was a moral not a physical malady. She ate no supper. Tit Nikonich politely said that he had no appetite either. Then came Raisky, who also wanted no supper, but sat silently at table, pretending not to notice the glances which Tatiana Markovna directed towards him from time to time. When Tit Nikonich had made his bow and departed, Tatiana Markovna prepared to retire. She hardly looked at Raisky when she bade him good night, because her affections and her self-esteem were both too deeply wounded. A secret and serious misfortune had befallen the family, but she was left on one side like a stranger, as if she were a useless, incapable woman. Raisky said in a low voice that he must speak with her. Bad news? she whispered, shivering and looking fixedly at him before she passed with him into her own room. She dropped into her old chair and pushed the lamp farther away, first covering it with a shade so that the room was dimly lighted. Raisky began his tale as cautiously as possible, but his lips trembled, and now and again his tongue refused its office but he collected all his strength and went on, although towards the end of his story his voice was hardly audible. Dawn had come, 
but throughout the long hours Tatiana Markovna had sat motionless and speechless with bowed head, giving vent now and then to a low moan. Raisky fell on his knees before her and implored her, Go to Vera's help. She has sent too late for grandmother. God will go to her help. Spare her and console her as you know how to do. She no longer has a grandmother, she said, going towards the door. Grandmother, what is the matter with you? cried Raisky, barring her way. You have no longer a grandmother, she said absently. Go, go. As he did not obey, she cried angrily, Don't come here. I will see no one. You must all of you leave me in peace he would have replied but she made an impatient gesture with her hand go to her she continued help her as far as you can grandmother can do nothing you have no longer a grandmother she made another gesture with her hand so imperious this time that he went without further parley but he concealed himself in the yard and watched her window Tatiana Markovna sank back in her chair and closed her eyes, and for a long time she remained there, cold and stiff as if she were a dead woman. Raisky, who had not gone to bed, and Vasilisa and Yakob as well, saw Tatiana Markovna with her head uncovered and her Turkish shawl thrown round her shoulders leave the house in the early morning and go out into the garden. It was as if a bronze figure had descended from its pedestal and had begun to walk. She passed through the flower garden and then through the avenue to the precipice. Then, striding slowly along with her head held high and without looking round, she went down the face of the cliff and disappeared. Concealing his presence in the trees, Raisky hurried after her, following her as she passed deeper and deeper down the precipice and until she reached the arbor where she paused raisky came closer and held his breath as he listened to tatiana markovna's heavy sighs and then heard her whisper my sin with her hands above her head she walked hastily on until she came to the bank of the river and stood still the wind wound her dress round her ankles disordered her hair and tugged at her shawl but she noticed nothing a terrible idea dawned on raisky that she intended to drown herself but his aunt turned back as she had come with slow strides which left deep prints in the damp sand raisky breathed more freely but when following her track in a parallel direction he caught sight of her face he held his breath in horror at the agony he saw written there. She had spoken truly. Their grandmother existed no longer. This was not grandmother, not Tatiana Markovna, the warm-hearted mistress of Malinovka, where the life and prosperity of the whole place depended on her, the wise and happy ruler of her little kingdom. It was as if she were not walking of her own accord, but was driven on by an impulse exterior to herself. As unconscious of her movements, she climbed the steep hill through the brushwood, with her shawl hanging down from her shoulders, dragging its corners in the dust. Her eyes, from which stony horror looked forth, were unwinking. Her manner was that of a moonstruck woman. Raisky found it difficult to follow her. She paused once, leaning both hands on a tree. My sin, she exclaimed again, how heavy is the burden. If it is not lightened, I can bear it no longer. She began again to climb quickly up the hill, surmounting the difficulties of the steep path with unnatural strength and leaving tags of her dress and her shawl behind her in the bushes. Overcome with amazement and horror, Raisky watched this new strange woman. He knew that only great souls conquer heavy trouble with strength like hers. 
they have wings like eagles to soar into the clouds and eagle eyes to gaze into the abyss this was not his grandmother she seemed to him to be one of those feminine figures which emerge from the family circle in the supreme moments of life under the heavy blows of fate, who bear great misfortunes majestically and are not overwhelmed. He saw in her a Jewess of the olden days, a noble woman of Jerusalem, who scorns the prophecy that her people will lose their fame and their honor to the romans but when the hour of fate has arrived when the men of jerusalem are watering its walls with their tears and beating their heads against the stones then she takes the ornaments from her hair puts on mourning garments and goes on her pilgrimage wherever the hand of jehovah leads his mind went back to another queen of misfortune to the russian marfa the enemy of the city of moscow who maintained her defiance even in her chains and dying directed the destiny of free novgorod before his imagination there passed a procession of other suffering women russian tsaritsas who at the wish of their husbands had adopted the dress of the nun and had maintained their intellect and their strength of character in the cloister Raisky diverted his attention from these unsummoned apparitions and looked attentively at the suffering woman before him. Tatiana Markovna's kingdom was perishing. Her house was left desolate. Her dearest treasure, her pride, her pearl had been taken from her and she wandered lonely among the ruins. When she paused in her walk in order to collect her strength, she tottered and would have fallen but for an inner whisper which assured her she would yet reach her goal. She pulled herself together and wandered on until evening. Half asleep, terrified by her crowding fancies, she spent the night on the sofa. At dawn she rose and went once more to the precipice. With her head resting on the bare boards, she sat for a long time on the crumbling threshold of the arbor then she went through the fields and was lost in the thicket on the bank of the river by chance her steps led her to the chapel where new terror seized her at the sight of the picture of the christ she fell on her knees like a wounded animal covered her face with her shawl and moaned my sin my sin tatiana markovna's servants had lost their heads in terror. Vasilisa and Jakob hardly stirred from the church. She intended, if her mistress recovered, to make her pilgrimage on foot to Kiev in order to venerate the miracle worker. He promised to the patron saint of the village a thick wax candle ornamented with gold. The rest of the servants hid themselves and only looked shyly out after their mistress as she wandered distraught through the fields and the woods for two days already tatiana markovna had eaten nothing raisky indeed tried to restrain her from leaving the house again but she waved him imperiously away then with decision he took a jug of water came up to her and took her hand she looked at him as if she did not know who he was then mechanically seized the jug in her trembling hand and drank greedily in big mouthfuls grandmother come home again and do not make both yourself and us wretched he begged you will kill yourself it is god's will i shall not lose my reason for i am upheld by his strength i must endure to the end do you raise me if i fall my sin she murmured and went on her way after she had gone a few steps she turned round and he ran to her if i do not survive she began signing to him to bow his head raisky knelt down and she pressed his head to her breast 
laid her hands on it and kissed him accept my blessing deliver it to marfinka and to her to my poor vera do you understand to her also grandmother he cried kissing her hand she tore her hand away and set out to wander once more through the thicket by the river bank and in the fields a devout soul obeys its own laws thought raisky as he dried his tears only a saint could suffer like this for the object of her love things were not going any better with vera raisky made haste to tell her of his conversation with their aunt when she sent for him early next morning in her anxiety to have news of tatiana markovna he pointed out of the window and vera saw how tatiana markovna was drifting urged on by the heavy hand of misfortune for a moment she caught sight of her expression and sank horrified on the floor but she pulled herself up again ran from one window to the other and stretched her hands out towards her grandmother then she rushed through the wide empty hall of the old house in a wild desire to follow tatiana markovna but she realized in time that it would have killed her aunt if she approached her just now vera was conscious now how deeply she had wounded another life so close to her own as she saw the tragic figure of her aunt so happy until recently and now bearing the punishment of another's sin Raisky brought her Tatiana Markovna's blessing, and Vera fell on his neck and wept for a long time. On the evening of the second day, Vera was found sitting in a corner of the great hall, half-dressed. Raisky and the priest's wife, who had just arrived, led her almost by force into her room and laid her down on the bed. Raisky sent for the doctor to whom he tried to explain her indisposition. The doctor prescribed a sedative, which Vera drank without being any calmer for it. She often walked in her sleep to ask after her grandmother. Give me something to drink. Don't say a word. Do not let anyone come to see me. Find out what grandmother is doing. It was just the same in the night. When she awoke, she would whisper, Grandmother doesn't come grandmother doesn't love me any more she has not forgiven me on the third day tatiana markovna left the house without being observed after two sleepless nights raisky had lain down and had given instructions to wake him if she left the house but yakov and vasilisa had gone to early mass and the other servants had paid no attention later on savelli saw that his mistress catching hold of the trees as she went was making her way from the precipice to the fields raisky hurried after her and watched her slow return to the house she stood still looked round as if she were saying good-bye to the group of houses groped with her hands and swayed violently then he rushed up to her brought her back to the house with vasilisa's help put her in her armchair and sent for the doctor vasilisa fell on her knees before her mistress little mother tatiana markovna she begged come back to us make the sign of the cross tatiana markovna crossed herself sighed and signed that she could not speak and wanted something to drink vasilisa undressed her wrapped her in warm sheets rubbed her hands and feet with spirit and then gave her some warm wine to drink the doctor prescribed for her but said that it was most important of all that she should not be disturbed but should be allowed to sleep an incautious word that tatiana markovna was ill reached vera's ears she pushed past natalia ivanovna and wanted to go over to the new house raisky had great difficulty in persuading her to abandon her attention as tatiana markovna lay in a deep sleep in the evening vera was worse she had fever and was delirious and during the night she flung herself from one side to another calling on her grandmother in her sleep and weeping raisky wanted to call the old doctor 
he waited impatiently till the morning and spent his time in going from vera to tatiana markovna and from tatiana markovna back to vera as vera's condition had not improved next morning raisky went with vasilisa into tatiana markovna's bedroom where they found the old lady in the same state as she had been in the whole of the day before i am afraid of going near her in case i alarm her he whispered should i awaken the mistress she must be awakened vera vasilievna is ill and i don't know whether i ought to send for the old doctor the words were hardly out of his mouth when tatiana markovna sat up is vera ill she said in a low voice raisky breathed more freely for his aunt in her present anxiety had lost the stony expression of yesterday she signed to him to leave the room half an hour later she was walking across the courtyard to the old house with trouble plainly depicted on her face but apparently without a trace of weariness she entered vera's room cautiously and when she saw the pale sleeping face whispered to raisky send for the old doctor she now noticed for the first time the priest's wife and her weary eyes she embraced natalia ivanovna and advised her kindly to go and get a whole day's rest when the doctor arrived tatiana markovna gave him an ingenious explanation of vera's indisposition he discovered symptoms of a nervous fever and prescribed medicine but on the whole he did not think that serious consequences need be expected if the patient could be kept quiet vera was half asleep when she took the medicine and towards evening fell fast asleep tatiana markovna sat down at the head of the bed watching her movements and listening to her breathing presently vera woke up and asked are you asleep natasha as she received no answer she closed her eyes but she could not go to sleep again and the darkness seemed to her to be a dark and terrible prison after a time she asked for something to drink someone handed her a cup how is grandmother asked vera opening her eyes only to close them again immediately natasha where are you come here why are you hiding she sighed and fell asleep again presently she woke again and whispered pitifully grandmother doesn't come grandmother loves me no longer and has not forgiven me grandmother is here she loves you and has forgiven you vera sprang from the bed and rushed up to tatiana markovna grandmother she cried half fainting and hiding her head on her breast tatiana markovna put her to bed again leaned her gray head by vera's white suffering face while the girl in a low voice with sighs and tears made her confession on her breast her aunt listened without speaking and presently wiped away vera's tears with her handkerchief and kissed her warmly and affectionately do not waste your caresses on me grandmother only do not leave me i do not deserve your caresses keep your kisses for my sister your sister is no longer in need of my caresses but i need your love if you forsake me vera i shall be a desolate old woman tatiana markovna wept mother forgive me whispered vera embracing her with her whole strength i have not been obedient to you and god has punished me she went on but tatiana markovna shut her mouth with a kiss do not talk like that vera interrupted her grandmother who had turned pale with horror and once more wore the aspect of the old woman who had been wandering about in the thicket by the precipice yes i thought that my own brain and will were self-sufficing that i was wiser than you all you are wiser than i and have more learning said tatiana markovna breathing more freely god has given you a clear understanding but you have not my experience vera thought that she had more experience also but she merely said take me away from here there is no vera any longer i want to be your marfinka 
take me away from this old house over there to you the two heads rested side by side on the pillow they lay in a close embrace and fell asleep end of chapter twenty nine